Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this AI for People uh, online seminar held under the auspices of the Atomium Institute and the European Parliament. Uh, I'm Robert Madeline, and I've been lucky to be in the AI for People game since its start many years ago before the first commission proposal. And it's my pleasure to moderate the discussion uh, through to noon today, Brussels time. So welcome to all of you joining as attendees and welcome to our panelists. Um, let me just say a few words to set up the conversation and then we'll begin. I intend to ask all the panelists to uh, offer some thoughts and then we'll embroider the conversation from there so that for attendees feel very free to use the chat, to raise issues that you think we've missed, contradictions, queries, and I will try to bring all the substance into the discussion. Um, we have a very distinguished panel, and I think you've all had the notification, but just quickly, uh, we'll be starting with Dragos Tudorake, who is a member of the European Parliament, has chaired its special committee on AI. Uh, Dr. Chandrima Ganguly from Fujitsu, Professor Dignam, Virginia Dignam is also present at the creation of the AI for People conversation. Uh, Angeliki Dedopoulou uh, from Meta in Brussels, Jordanka Ivanova um, from DG Connect, and then uh, Detlef Eckert, who is a special advisor with, with one of the firms I work with, but who's also a big thinker on digital since his time with various uh, companies and most especially in the European Commission. So that's the panel and it will be great, but the more the attendees are active as well, the better the conversation will be. So let's begin. I, I turn first to you, Dragos. I mean, people have been following AI now for some years in Brussels. We're not really sure whether it's all going to be uh, satisfactory legislated before the end of this mandate, but you've been really driving the action especially on the substance. And I'd really like your appreciation of where we are uh, today in terms of the prospects for the Council and Parliament assembling a final uh, legislative package. And in that context, uh, about the sandbox issue, which is, of course, our core theme this morning. So, Dragos, over to you first. Well, many thanks, uh, Robert, and, and good morning to everyone, and thanks to A for People for for this invitation. Um, well, I certainly I will start by by saying that certainly I hope <laughs> and I trust that we will be finishing in this mandate. Uh, there is no scenario, not even the bleakest of, of, of scenarios, where I see this uh, spilling over into the next mandate. Um, although. I did hear some voices saying that, well, maybe we should be taking slower because we are, after all, dealing, and that is true, with very complex, sensitive, uh, politically important issues, and therefore we have to do it right. But I do think that we can uh, finish these negotiations uh, in this mandate without sacrificing in any way uh, uh, out of the quality and the thought that we're going to invest in the process. So where are we today? Council is ready, as you probably know and, and read, um, is ready and is ready and it gives me hope, not only because they finished in time, but because if I look at, at uh, some of the elements uh, that are part of their final position, uh, I think that we as Parliament, although we are still in the middle of the process, we will be finishing that far from those positions, not everywhere, but on most of the points, which will mean that once we start trilogues, uh, we should be able to see eye to eye. In Parliament, we have already uh, went past the initial calendar we had. Um, it's true that when we devised the calendar back in spring, number one, we did not expect that we would have so many amendments. Number two, we already then had to extend uh, and, and we lost two weeks in the process because uh, colleagues requested extra time to put in amendments. And then also some of the contributing committees uh, have taken longer than planned to submit their contributions for the bigger debate. Um, but it's not, it's no one's blame. Uh, it certainly is a very complex uh, proposal. I don't need to <laughs> explain that to, I think, to anybody. Um, and also the 
with the governance we have inside the parliament uh, is probably one of the most complex that we've seen in some time with two committees on equal footing, two rapporteurs, two shadows from each political groups, uh, rapporteurs from the other committees. So all in all, when we have a political shadows meeting, it looks like the committee, um, which certainly doesn't make it simpler for the discussions. But we are plowing um, uh, along. We, uh, I'm based on the conversations and the agreements I have with my fellow rapporteur, we are now planning to have a vote in February, um, which means that we should be starting trilogues uh, by March. And uh, that, again, a bit with a delay from our initial planning, but that should still uh, give us uh, enough time to finish by the end of the year, which is our ambition. So that's pretty much where we stand in terms of what we have gone through already in Parliament. Uh, and this, in a way, links up to the second point that you've uh, put forward for discussion, which is uh, sandboxes. Uh, sandboxes is uh, fortunately, and I'm very happy uh, with that, is uh, in the list of things that we have uh, either agreed entirely or almost agreed. Um, and there is a very healthy majority uh, behind uh, the drive to have sandboxes as a key enabler of innovation uh, in this text um, with a very clear uh, enumeration of objectives for the sandboxes also with a governance that would allow for lessons learned to be used for best practices to be compiled and put there for the benefit of everyone including for the benefit of, of uh, a renewed and, and revamped governance structure that I'm hoping will uh, stay much closer to the ground, uh, will have the chance to get a reality check constantly so that the work they will do, the decisions they will make, the adaptations to the legislation they will have to go through will be as uh, adapted as possible to, uh, again, to the reality of implementing or uptaking AI. So um, in a nutshell, that's what where we are. Um, if you want me to go further in, in depth on whatever other point, I will happily do so, including on sandboxes. Thank you. Yeah, but that's very, that's very helpful. And it shows clearly, I think, that we're still in time, but we're not, uh, we're not too late, but we're not too early in discussing this sort of issue. Uh, so personally, having uh, banged the drum about sandboxes as a technique for at least five, six years in Brussels, I'm very pleased to see that in this crucial regulatory debate, it's part of the picture. And I think today, I hope with the help of our uh, other panelists and yourself, Dragos, we'll be able to unpick what it means and how to make it realistic. And so that's why I'm very pleased that we have uh, two uh, of our six panelists from uh, companies which are AI innovators. And I'd like first then to turn to Chandrima Ganguly from Fujitsu Research and, and ask you the question, in the context of the uh, AI development that you run for a major global company with an AI for good commitment, do you do sandboxes already? Do you reach out with work in progress to regulators? How much of a difference could this make? And do you think a company like yours will pick up the idea on the table? Is it useful for you, Chandrim? Thank you so much uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak and thank you for the questions, uh, Robert, and, and the update, uh, Dragos, that was very informative. So at Fujitsu, uh, when we practice AI ethics within the team, we have a very specific uh, perspective on this, which is all, all the work that we do, we try to make it as people-centered, as human-centered as possible. And therefore, um, with regards to sandboxes, we really see this as an opportunity to create partnerships. And sandboxes, to our mind, will be a forum, an effective forum, to bring together various stakeholders. But let me be specific about who these stakeholders could be. So it could be, of course, the regulatory entities, which are super important for um, ensuring that AI is deployed responsibly. It could be the te technology generation entities, such as Fujitsu or other technology corporations. And finally, I think it's really important to bring into this forum the voices of communities of civil society actors. And this can be effectively incorporated to our mind to every stage of the sandbox design process. Um, if we just break it up into three parts, that is what kind of data sets will go into sandboxes. These data sets um, 
in, like enshrined within a specific and good privacy uh, preserving protocols could be contributed by civil society groups and the standardization uh, certifications that we would have over data sets to ensure interoperability between cross, cross sectors, so sandboxes that are deployed for different business use cases and across member states, these standards would be effectively and transparently communicated to these civil society actors. And then, you know, if we're trying to design some metrics, uh, fairness metrics or unbiasedness metrics, these metrics can also be a uh, group source from these community actors. And finally, at Fujitsu, we're very keen on making sure that once the algorithm leaves the sandbox, our responsibility doesn't end. So not only do we want a human in the loop uh, monitoring of this uh, sandbox at a fixed interval of time, we are also keen to put forward the idea that some automated monitoring algorithm has to work alongside this to make sure that alerts can be raised at some standardized threshold to communicate not only that the algorithm's accuracy has dropped due to the changing real world scenario that it's trying to model, but also the unbiasedness standards that we have set out for the algorithm at the time of uh, sandbox testing. And through all of this, we really want to emphasize the role of civil society and how much uh, we have to make sure that we include them in the conversation and have an effective partnership with these actors and with these stakeholders to make sure that all the regulations that we're putting forward actually align with the values and the needs of the people that we're trying to protect. And, and so crudely, do you see a sandbox as also playing a role in getting your stuff to market faster or just in, in improving the stuff? Is it about so, regulatory approval? I mean, do you, do you think there'll be a trade-off that if you go into the sandbox, somehow regulators will say, you can put it on the street now, as long as you share some data, or do you think that it's simply going to be a publicly mandated instance for open innovation of the sort you discuss? So, um... In terms of AI ethics, um, we don't like to think of terms of, of algorithms going to market quickly and optimizing over the speed at which algorithms are deployed. We are very keen to make sure that the algorithm deployed is responsible. And so whether it be through regulatory processes and including the voice of civil society actors, that would be the, uh, you know, the quantity or the concept that we would like to optimize on to make sure that it remains responsible. So yes, we would welcome uh, regulatory uh, cooperation and collaboration in making sure that we do um, AI right in a way. Well, that's, that's very encouraging. Thank you very much. I mean, it's encouraging to me wearing my old sort of uh, regulators hat, whether, whether everybody else thinks the same, we'll find out. Uh, Professor Dignan, Virginia. Uh, you are uh, sitting now in Sweden, but you're a sort of uh, acknowledged global authority on AI ethics. You've been part of the AI for people game so far. Maybe, maybe I could ask you to, to talk to us about what role, in your view, sandboxes could play and whether you think it's an essential, should it be mandatory? That sort of open innovation step that Chandrima has described involving civil society is that almost a duty for any responsible innovator? Uh, but also whether you see in the discussions you have more widely than today, people saying actually um, this is going to slow things down without improving quality. I mean, is there are there things we should be attentive to as we finalize uh, a feasible regulation for sandboxes? Virginia, over to you. And you're muted. I better unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question and for the invitation to be here today. It's my pleasure to, to join this uh, very uh, nice group of uh, uh, panelists. Um, yes, uh, uh, I, I did like a lot uh, what Chandrina was desc describing in terms of open innovation and uh, co collaboration, participation and innovation. Uh, what I, I see very often in the discussions going around and mostly uh, talking with, uh, with industry is that still there, there is very much this feeling that uh, regulation somehow is uh, an impediment for innovation. And that's something which 
which comes again and again in in many of the discussions that people feel either we can innovate freely or we are going to be blocked in our work by um, by regulations. Um, I, I think that that shows both um, a kind of a, a misunderstanding of what innovation really is and also um, a misunderstanding of the role of uh, regulation. Uh, innovation is, of course, not just using the technology as it is now, but it's uh, exactly the, the, the opportunity and the capability to move uh, technology forward to uh, develop uh, better technology better in it can be defined in many different ways if we take regulation as um, a stepping stone or at least a, a beacon pointing out what kind of better innovation or what kind of desirable innovation is there, uh, then we can really use re regulation as a stepping stone towards uh, beneficial and uh, useful innovations. So I, I do think that we need to have a better uh, narrative or a better dialogue between regulators and uh, practitioners to really uh, understand, make this, uh, this uh, understanding uh, better and that people really uh, take uh, re the, the benefits of regula see re re uh, regulation not just as a kind of a, a block on their uh, on their uh, processes but really as a beneficial uh, uh, process forward which would of course not only uh, ensure uh, uh, user and citizen um, um, involvement and citizen uh, um, benefits but also would be beneficial from the perspective of um, um, uh, business differentiation and uh, stepping forward on, on innovation, like I say. So having said that, I think that sandboxes are a very good way to put it together, to combine the, the drive for innovation from organizations with the, the directions, the, 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 the regulatory directions that are put forward by uh, by um, by the regulators, by policymakers, uh, and the it should be um, a way that contributes both for uh, the checking and uh, evaluating the, the, the industrial innovations, but also by the, the policymakers can be seen and should be seen as a way to really uh, improve on the regulation and improve especially on the, on the design of the regulation. So often the, the direction in which the regulation wants to go, it's clear, but it can be implemented in different ways and a sandbox would be a way also to support the, the policymakers on identifying the most uh, suitable uh, implementation or uh, operationalization of regulation. Uh, and in that, uh, I, I, I'm also currently working together with the GPI, the Global Partnership on AI, which is a, a, a international collaboration between many different countries and the Euro European Union as well. And there the idea is that uh, we should be looking at the, not only, uh, of course, looking first at all the different uh, initiatives initiatives international in terms of sandboxes and there are many countries uh, uh, within Europe and outside Europe working on uh, their own proposals and their own ways for uh, sandboxing but also looking at how can we uh, use sandbox also as a way to um, uh, to integrate the different um, the, the needs and the realities of the different uh, uh, countries, different uh, regulatory regimes, and also uh, different uh, uh, societal uh, environments. So we could also see sandboxes as something which would be unifying or at least integrating the different approaches uh, that are taking in different parts of the world. And I think I stop here now, and then we can continue the discussion later. Anna. That's that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, and the 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 point you make about there can be lessons for AI innovators, but also for regulators out of the sandbox. That's that's very important, as well as the sandbox game as being an instance for global cooperation. But can I ask you one specific question before we sure. move on? Chandrima was focusing also very much on. Um, civil society involvement, mm -hmm. ordinary people. And yeah. personally, this sort of open innovation approach is one that 
I believe in. I think even in very techie areas, yeah. ordinary people know a lot about what they want and can sometimes say things and see things that developers and experts can then take back into their practice. In, in your view, is that also something which is um, favoured around Europe? I mean, now you've moved to, to be based in Sweden, although you're a sort of global leader, thought leader for yeah. us in these areas. I mean, do, do the Scandinavians say yes with civil society or do they trust their regulators so much that people just mm -hmm. to let the regulators get on with it? No. Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I, I think that they do tr trust their regulators more than other parts of Europe, at least the, the parts of Europe that I know of. And it's, uh, but uh, the, the idea of participatory design and particip uh, civil society participation is extremely uh, integrated in the Scandinavian way of doing things. So participatory design is something which the Scandinavian countries uh, kind of claim as something that has been initially uh, many uh, already uh, many many years many decades ago uh, mostly initiated in in um, in the Scandinavian uh, area and it's something which is really uh, deeply integrated in the way that things are being done in in Sweden and other uh, Nordic countries and I, I do think that it's a essential it essential for any um, in innovation to, of course, uh, include the civil so society, including citizens, including the, the users or the consumers in general. I don't necessarily see, I mean, I think it should be part of uh, sandboxing efforts, but I see it as so integral to innovation that it should be, um, it should be a natural thing to do whether or not you will have a sandbox environment for the regulation, uh, uh, the regulatory part. Of course, they should, uh, civil society should be involved as well in sandboxing, but uh, it should be, it should be kind of natural for, and I think that for many organizations and like uh, definitely the ones here today, but for many other organizations, I think it's something which is increasingly part of, let's say, the normal way of doing uh, de industrial development and uh, oh. innovation in industry. Yeah. At least yeah. I hope so. No, it's very interesting. I mean, my, my own personal instinct is in areas like debiasing, we we really need the voice of ordinary people, non-AI experts, because sometimes if we leave it to ourselves, you know, a panel like this, we can invent all sorts of debiasing issues and we might miss the big one. Uh, we should, of course, always realize that debiasing means that we are putting the bias somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It is impossible to to have uh, data sets which are not biased. Uh, what we can be is open about the the way and the the, the kind of uh, bias that are uh, known about the, the the systems. And indeed, in that case, so uh, identifying the biases, uh, civil society is much more uh, likely to be. Uh, to be uh, uh, the ones which are able to uh, most correctly identify bias because yeah. they they will see it from many different perspectives which cannot be even in a, the most uh, inclusive and participatory type of group you cannot have ever all the all the voices so uh, cool. definitely there uh, the identification of bias and the the dealing with the, the existing bias is some something which re really requires uh, civil uh, citizens and users to participate perfect uh, dragos you you had the comment to chip in on yes uh, thank you um interesting question and, and issue on bias um I met recently with a consortium of, uh, speaking of civil society involvement and activism on this, uh, with a very interesting consortium of uh, professors, civil society activists, engineers, um, developers of AI, who had actually come together to devise a methodology to audit AI, particularly from the uh, bias and, let's say, fundamental rights uh, and impact on society point of view. Um, and they had working right now at a kind of an end-to-end -end audit uh, methodology um, that I think would complement and, and also reflecting on what you were saying earlier, uh, Robert, and your question as to whether, for example, uh, sandboxes or the type of interaction that was mentioned earlier 
should be mandatory or it should be left uh, a bit to the uh, to the will of the developer. Um, I think here also reflecting a bit on the discussions that we've had ourselves in in here in the Parliament team when uh, working the provisions on sandbox. I think it is clear that there have to be a complementarity between what will be achieved in the sandbox in this sort of institutionalized environment that we would create via the AI Act, um, which according to our vision is something that uh, should be mandatory, i.e. Uh, anyone that wants to have access to this sort of a testing bed should have that access. So it's something that we see very much from the perspective of leveling the playing field and giving access to any developer, whether big or small, that wants to have that safe interaction with the regulator to have the possibility to do that. But that would not exclude that either companies themselves, as we've heard from Fujitsu earlier, may decide to do their own assessments, also with the help of civil society or other type of expertise, simply because they believe in that and it's part of the way they responsibly want to put things on the market. And then it's also, again, their choice of whether they want to complement that with also going in a sandbox or not, or they believe that that sort of responsible self-check that they make is enough. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, again, I think there is complementarity between the two. And certainly, I think we as society generally would be better off by having as much of this sort of uh, uh, verification and trial and error and auditing uh, as possible, particularly at the beginning when we need to build trust. And the whole the whole discussion <laughs> uh, also about the regulation that we are working on is about building trust in the society uh, on this technology and recognizing that this is something, this technology is something that is going to be in everything we do. And therefore, if we don't have that element of trust in there, there's going to be a very difficult uptake and, and therefore uh, inclusion of everyone in this transformation. Yeah, that's very clear. Thank you very much for that additional thought. Uh, going on with our uh, panelists in the order initially planned, Angeliki, uh, you work at Meta in Brussels covering these issues quite closely. So. Maybe I could ask from your perspective as another uh, corporate innovator, um, what you feel at the moment about the run of play, as we might say, on the AI Act, and in particular, how you see the sandbox concept fitting with what you do as a company. Thank you to be part of this interesting discussion today. Um, so I will start um, with our views uh, regarding the need uh, for a holistic approach to experimentation, which uh, has been also very well explained by uh, the previous panelists, uh, which considers uh, in a way not only um, uh, actually regulatory boxes, sandboxes, but also policy prototyping. Uh, another interesting concept that I would like to uh, discuss with you uh, today. And uh, our work also we've done with the Open Loop uh, program on the AI Act. Um, later on, I can also dive in a bit more on the research and the preliminary insights we've collected on the regulatory uh, sandbox provision. So um, uh, we believe that in addition uh, to, but also as a way to complement uh, regulatory sandboxes, other, actually, there are also other and additional experimental governance methods like uh, policy prototyping, uh, which uh, we believe that um, should be developed and implemented as well. Um, they both belong to the experimental governance family. Um, however, they do slightly different things and operate in, in different uh, contexts, namely in, in different uh, regulatory environments. So, as you know, uh, regulatory sandboxes operate in the, in the context of existing legislation and allow for the testing of technolo technological innovations under uh, regulatory, regulatory oversight. They operate uh, by uh, granting specific temporary exemption of um, specific legal requirements uh, by creating, for example, a, a lighter regulatory environment for companies. Um, they also uh, are useful when trying uh, to reform existing uh, rules to accommodate technological advances. For example, um, are used around the world uh, to experiment with uh, changes to existing uh, financial uh, regulatory rules so that they better uh, accommodate uh, new financial technology applications and tools. 
On the other hand, um, policy prototyping operates in the absence of existing legislation and allows for um, regulatory experimentation when uh, contemplating a new regulatory framework, um, rather than uh, merely updating an existing one to accommodate a new technology. Uh, policy prototyping also provides a more holistic experimental uh, governance platform, examining and testing uh, different regulatory and non-regulatory uh, instruments. And as we know, there is currently a difficulty in, in assessing um, the most, let's say, appropriate and feasible balance amongst uh, governance instruments. We have um, different types of, of those. We have laws, we have regulations, we have standards. Um, uh, also, the colleague from Fujitsu, uh, Fujitsu um, discussed about ethical frameworks. So, in a complex uh, topic as AI, we believe that um, policy prototyping, um, it's in this way, it can provide a better, let's say, testing platform um, to, uh, to explore different combinations uh, amongst those instruments while um, bringing AI actors and stakeholders uh, together, as also uh, Dragos and Virginia uh, mentioned uh, before. So to promote the, the adoption of uh, experimental approaches in, in emerging uh, tech policy making, uh, we have initiated and, and supported the, the launch of Open Loop, which is a, a global strategic initiative, uh, and we can describe it as also a consortium um, of uh, different types of stakeholders. So we brought together regulators, governments, um, the private sector, um, tech businesses, academics, but also civil society, a type of stakeholder that um, we have mentioned also the importance of, of which we, we mentioned before, um, that promote and, and deploy experimental uh, regulatory efforts in, in the field of new and emerging technologies like AI. So um, Open Loop uh, co-creates and tests new governance frameworks through uh, policy prototyping programs, and at the same time uh, supports the evaluation of existing legal frameworks through uh, regulatory sandbox uh, exercises. Uh, if we have more time, we can also uh, discuss a bit uh, later how we do this and also the type of uh, results that uh, we had uh, after um, the first pilot exercise that we conducted uh, in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, since in our preparatory conversations, you mentioned your recent report, I had the opportunity to glance through it. And for those on the call who haven't seen it, it's it's interesting. It's a very this sort of policy prototyping technique applied to AI and as, as your report says with a sort of uh, bonus uh, conversation around sandboxes which in a way reinforced in my mind reading it much of what we've heard today about people saying basically this participatory approach can be very useful so, so that, thank you for that that's very interesting. Chanjima you, you had raised your hand but I hadn't noticed it do you want to come in now? Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing in response to Dragos and uh, Virginia that, uh, of course, participatory design approaches have to be implemented in the design process. But I think what sandboxes really do is that they allow the auditability and accountability processes to be more decentralized. So the way we report metrics, the way we report um, the, the, the results of sandbox testing, if that can be made transparent and available to civil society actors, I think that would also be a major place where sandboxes could have a role. That's it, but thank you. Definitely, good point. Very good. Uh, so now, now I'd like then to, to go on to my, my colleagues from DG Connect. So Jordanka, um, you and I have discussed sandboxes in the past, but since then things have accelerated. You've uh, co-hosted with Spain the um, the initial sort of show and tell of what uh, Madrid has been doing. And we had tried also to have your, uh, our colleagues from Spain on the call, but it's Spain's national day today. So happy feast uh, uh, to Spain. But it means that we have to ask you as the European Commission, not only where you see sandboxes coming out, are there, are there missing pieces you, in what you've heard so far that you would like to emphasize? Um, and how you think we're going to really bootstrap a process that has been discussed in Brussels in a general way for a long time, but we've never legislated to do sandboxes before. So, so just tell us 
What does that feel like as a, as a regulator? You have this big piece of blank paper, and although Dragos and his colleagues will help you fill in the gaps, that still doesn't take you to launch. So where are you on sandboxes in the development in anticipation of the law being finalized and then in a couple of years later entering into force? What, how is this, in a way, policy innovation going? Robert and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so indeed, um, it's so interesting to discuss this topic, and I think you posed so many questions. So I'll try to to maybe also react to many of the things that were said, um, uh, because there is a lot of things ongoing. Indeed, the pilot in Spain, but also um, uh, the work we are doing on sandboxes in general, and all the important changes that are now discussed both by the Council and the Parliament. Um, just to start and frame the discussion, indeed, you are fully right. The AI Act will be actually the first legislation that tries to create the common framework, how those AI sandboxes should work in practice, because we have plenty of examples in sandboxes in other sectors, but they have all emerged without actually a common framework and a legal basis. So, now we have the unique opportunities to set the objectives right and also the common framework, the governance. So we are sure that we really fulfill and we have uniform approach how they are implemented in Europe because we have seen that actually there are also certain challenges when many countries start to create those sandboxes, especially with rules that are supposed to be harmonized if they are uh, implemented in, in different ways. So that's why that was our key objective to really propose the sandboxes as a key tool to really show that yes, this legislation is innovation friendly. It should be both supporting innovation, excellence, and also the trust uh, in AI systems and bring benefits to everyone, to the companies to get legal certainty and also some safe environment to experiment and have a very good dialogue with authorities and to the regulators to really get their hands on on the actual implementation, learn, uh, better understand risks um, and challenges, but also opportunities, and be able to actually have this flexibility and ag agile environment to test, learn, uh, and also give uh, and adapt their interpretation of the legislation, and also take that into account even for future amendments, because we know that we try to phrase the AI Act as a future-proof in, uh, instrument to be able to add more use cases in the future for high risk, for example, um, or to, to see how we could adapt to existing requirements um, for um, and also the link with the standards. Because here I, I would uh, agree with Angeliki that our objective has been never just to focus only on these rules, we wanted to have a more comprehensive approach, uh, look at also uh, standards uh, that and the effectiveness on standards um, uh, or even voluntary codes of conduct that could be applied to AI systems. Um, and also have uh, the regulators um, uh, on board because this is this is a key feature for the sandboxes. We really have to have the regulators. We have many other um, uh, existing sandboxes uh, from companies, but here we think the advantage is really to have this cooperation and dialogue um, between uh, those who are designing and implementing the rules and the companies who have to actually um, get the guidance uh, and be able to to fulfill the legal requirements. Um, and also in certain cases, uh, yes, we agree, regulators should have the flexibility. There have been also discussions now a lot in the council, also to better clarify how these sandboxes could be used also for real world testing. One could even think for a step afterwards because now the sandboxes were a bit limited before the conformity assessment and before they are placed on the market. But if you look at broader interaction with users and others, um, um, there could be also interesting ways to, to look at in a more holistic way how those sandboxes uh, could be implemented. And here I, I would agree with um, and what was said by um, Sandrima that actually something that we think could be added by 
view also for the parliament to consider is how besides the companies, the regulators, and also the, a bit the broader ecosystem of testing, innovation, standardization organizations that we have already proposed, we could also better get on board the civil society because this is something that uh, I think uh, would be certainly very valuable. Um, and also then how to, to really involve, get also uh, their knowledge uh, and have the transparency of all those results. Um, this is something key because we, we fully agree that um, uh, these results should be as transparent as possible. That's why we propose to have like annual reports. They should be published. Um, they should be also shared with the AI board, the commission, and then we should use them for, for the future uh, regulatory learning uh, and also uh, to, to give the right tools also to companies and, and share these good practices uh, to, to everyone. Um, because here, maybe just to touch on what Drago said, we've seen from other sandboxes, uh, if they are not still able for everyone to get access to them, there are limited resources for regulators. Um, and it also takes a lot of uh, time um, and we have to really be targeted on in, in deciding who enters into the sandbox and, and then using this experience. So. Um, um, in, in this case, um, we think indeed, yes, that there should be a very a clear framework with good principles um, that should apply for all countries um, who can get access to the sandbox um, and then have this transparent process where results are shared with everyone and they are also made available to also other companies so everyone can uh, benefit uh, from this um, knowledge. Um, and then indeed the governance is a very important aspect. Um, we, we welcome all the efforts that are put indeed to better uh, increase um, uh, the knowledge, the sharing, the cooperation uh, with the member states there and also with the board and the commission. That was our purpose with the framework we proposed to create implementing rules with these common standards and then also to, to give an important role also to the AI board uh, where we, we want to have this coordination. Um, now, before the AI Act is actually adopted, we have started in the commission with an expert group of member states because we think indeed that sandboxes a regulatory sandboxes could be useful even before the AI Act is adopted. And here what Angeliki is saying, we don't look them only after the AI Act is adopted as a tool to implement it or, or derogate uh, from rules. Uh, that's still an open issue because uh, um, we, we haven't gone there yet. Um, but we think that actually they can be also useful even now uh, during this preparation period and that's why we have launched this pilot with our colleagues from Spain where we think that yes we could already test uh, the proposed requirements for the AI Act and use this experience to feed into our future standardization process so we could have a limited number of companies who try to implement uh, those uh, uh, requirements and we learn from this practical experience and feed into the future uh, standardization and other tools and guidance that we're going to create at European level. And for that purpose, we also have an EU expert group um, where we try to also involve other EU countries and we try to bring the links and make those results from the Spanish pilot project most useful. So um, it is indeed a type of policy prototyping what, which we plan to use for our standardization and guidance work. And the idea is to launch it um, early next year where companies uh, could apply. Um, as said, there will be limited resources because it is quite intensive and not everyone can join, but the, um, the funding they have, uh, there is uh, already now is uh, to cover around uh, 15 pilots that could implement um, the, the requirements and we learn from that experience. So our idea is indeed to, to encourage more member states to join the pilot and also in the future, once we have the, um, the final implementing rules and common European framework, um, then also to, to support um, um, the further outreach of, of those sandboxes and make them more accessible. So I stop here and I'm happy to reply to any questions. So.
So, so that's very interesting. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and comments, but you, you put your finger on the issue of supply and demand and the, the model you seem to be discussing is one where every regulator might have a sandbox, but it has to be owned by regulators. Whereas I think out there, there may be academics or companies who are saying maybe we can run sandboxes, although clearly there has to be a regulatory presence to make it useful. And of course, both models are known to EU regulatory habit. For example, most abattoirs are owned privately, but a publicly, a public service veterinarian has to be present because it's a very important step for food safety. So that's just an example. But do you do you envisage that it's what we're setting up are implementing rules for fit for purpose sandboxes and then there can be a market for sandboxes, or is it only public provision of sandboxes? Oh, well, the way we have proposed it is really to have the competent regulators on board. So that's why uh, we have proposed it as a regulatory sandbox based on experience in other sector, like in FinTech or energy and others. Now it's true you could have many other industry sandboxes. Sometimes you even don't have to have a regulator on board. You could have many other tools to, to try to experiment, to innovate. But for the purposes of the AI Act, our regulatory learning that we want to, to get out from this, um, um, we have tried to be a bit more focused and, and really have the competent authorities on board and, and then to be um, implementing. Uh, and then, yes, there are maybe ways how we could maybe learn or get better results for also from other sandboxes. So there could be maybe interesting contributions that could further build the system. But for now, under the uh, proposal, of the commission um, and that was not uh, included. No, but I think that's that that seems to me one of the issues that will continue to be discussed because the the evolution of many regulatory oversight mechanisms sometimes it starts only in government, but then if there's a demand exceeding supply and government can't, as you say immediately supply all the answers itself, then there are ways to multiply the offer while still, I would say you always have to have the regulator in the loop, but maybe sandboxes can't, don't ultimately need to be built only in government ministries. It's that sort of question, but I'm just the chairman. And I think we, we will come back to that and other questions as we um, move from the panel towards the open conversation. So let me say for our attendees that the panelists and I could happily have our conversation all on our own, but we're very happy to take uh, comments and questions through the chat function uh, and the Q&A. Um, before I move to Detlef, Angeliki is asking for the floor. So Angeliki, over to you. Yes, thank you, Robert. Um, so I fully agree with what um, your Duncan just mentioned on the way that uh, regulatory sandboxes should function. Um, I just wanted to highlight a bit from the um, private sector, I mean, as how we do it actually, um, how we implement this program uh, within Meta, so very briefly. Um, so to understand a bit better of um, how the like sandboxes work in practice in a way. So uh, first, uh, what we do is to gather a group of um, tech companies, uh, in this case, provisioning products or services um, powered by AI technologies, let's call them participants. Um, secondly, what we do is to, um, uh, we co-create normative frameworks or uh, leverage existing ones, um, uh, well, the ones that we call them, and I, I actually called before as policy prototypes, and we choose specific topics uh, related to emerging technologies, in this case AI. And third, what we do is uh, we ask participants to apply uh, the prototypes to their specific AI applications and at the same time um, to collect information about their experience in, in doing so. 
Um, so in other words, what we do is we test and evaluate these prototypes under real world conditions um, by uh, collecting information uh, from participants as they apply these frameworks to their specific products and services. And uh, we are at the same time, we ask them questions about um, how we um, clear operational and effective these policy prototypes are. And um, we learn um, about their um, strengths and limitations of, of such uh, practices. Um, what we do uh, after is we apply the lessons learned to iterate on and, and improve uh, these normative uh, frameworks. And at the end, um, we uh, deliver evidence-based uh, policy recommendations to policymakers um, based on the findings of the program and the feedback uh, collected. And um, what we also do is sometimes we also um, publish uh, under Creative Commons the, the prototype. Um, so this, in a nutshell, the, the procedure we follow um, as a private company uh, to, to test uh, such practice. I would be more than happy also to share with you the, um, the results uh, of this exercise uh, later on to have a bit of idea of how um, companies, in particular small and medium enterprises, think about the process. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. And Dragos, you also had your hand up. Yes, for, for two reasons. Number one, uh, to, to give a reflection of, of my own on this, but also to say that in about two minutes I have to disappear. So if there is anything else that you want me to address, um, this would be the moment. Um, on, on a question, which is a very important one. Um, I personally, and again, this reflects also a bit the discussion that we're having here in Parliament, would like to see as many sandboxes as possible. But for me, a key uh, element in a sandbox to differentiate them from any other innovation hub or digital hub or anything else out there, which might be set up by industry or by an university, by whoever to actually stimulate innovation, the, the, the key difference uh, for a sandbox is the presence of a regulator. Uh, I very much like your uh, comparison with the abattoirs because that's in a way <laughs> something that, that could, could work outside the sandboxes that would actually be set up by the authorities themselves. And we want to create at least a, a minimum basis of that. That is why, uh, at least in our text in Parliament, we are saying that it is mandatory for each member state to set up at least one so that it is a minimum starting point to have uh, at, at, the member, at the level of each member state. We also say that it is possible to have cross-border and in fact, we would like to see a rollout as many as, of, as many sandboxes as possible. But again, it is essential that the regulator will be present there. And the second point is, what do you do with the results of whatever happens in sandbox? And this is where governance is important. That's why I also mentioned at the beginning, the need to have a different approach to governance, because if you don't have a possibility to bring all of the lessons, all of the best practices from all of these sandboxes, whether they are set up by the authorities or by a private entity together with uh, an authority, if you can't bring them somewhere uh, so that everyone could benefit from those best practices and lessons learned, then I think a very important, valuable element of a sandbox is lost. So uh, for me, um, if we will end up, and I hope we will, with some sort of a centralized uh, part of governance, not only with the national silos, uh, for me, that would be a key function for this sort of European level entity that would be overseeing the implementation of the future regulation would be to actually coordinate work uh, out whatever comes out of the sandboxes uh, and, and put that to good use. Thank you. And before I let you go, Dragos, I wanted to ask one follow-up question. You know, when, when you legislate a goal, we have to also legislate the means. So in the country, for example, that you know best, I don't know whether they've had many fintech sandboxes, but in countries which haven't had previous experience, complying with everyone should have one will be harder than if you go to a country that's already done fintech sandboxing. Is there something in your personal um, vision that will enable all the member states to catch up? Is there peer-to-peer -peer learning? Is there subsidy? Is there, right, how will that work? I think a bit of both. Uh, I think peer-to-peer -peer is very important. Um, 
but also a bit of help from above. And that is why the role of both the Commission as well as this sort of entity, whatever we'll call it uh, at European level, that would work with the set boxes in each member state will be important. Because there will need to be a bit of a kick at the beginning, particularly, as you say, in some of the member states that have not had any sort of natural appetite for developing these sort of structures. Uh, they will need to learn from somewhere. They will need to get the, the, the T0 <laughs> from somewhere. And again, that is both will have to be a combination of peer to peer uh, learning also to work with the private sector that might help actually in this. Uh, and I think we also have to put the right mindset uh, in our, with our governments to to tell them that it's not bad to actually work with the private sector. On the contrary, they can learn from the private sector, including on how to set up the sandboxes and, of course, also help from help from Brussels. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. And thank you very much for, for staying so long. We know you have a very busy day. Thank you. Um, if if uh, I now, with Detlef's indulgence, I will now take the other two raised hands on the panel and then Detlef, and then we open to the questions from our uh, attendee audience. So Chandrima first and then Virginia. Uh, uh, thank you, Robert. So I just wanted to address a few of the points that were raised. Um, one was about um, ownership of sandboxes. I think this was discussed uh, by Yodanka. So something that I think would be really useful um, in terms of how the sandbox is governed is that if there could be a distributed ownership uh, governance model so that we could really benefit from the uh, you, you know, the, the technological know-how and the skills and expertise that um, come from private enterprise and also from innovation, but also to have the regulatory insight and experience that the public sector might be able to provide. Um, yes, I think that was the point I wanted to make, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Virginia? Yeah, uh, two things. One is also to let you know that unfortunately I will need to leave in around 15 minutes due to other commitments, which requires me to move physically to another uh, place. Now this combination of hybrid and uh, live meetings is uh, more complex often. Anyway, uh, I, I fully agree with what um, um, Dragos was saying in terms that the main difference with sandboxes is that the presence of the regulator. So that's something which is kind of uh, the, the differentiator for this uh, this type of activities. Uh, I, I will leave it to, to him or for the commission to decide whether or not this uh, uh, obligation for each member state to uh, to make um, a sandbox is something which is uh, it's for them to enforce. I, I don't have really an opinion there, but I, I do think that it's uh, it's important to also focus or maybe especially in in those uh, in those situations or those countries in which uh, sandboxes is not really something which is very uh, known about. It's probably a good idea to focus on specific um, specific types of. Uh, um, of activities or specific types of um, areas in which uh, might be uh, most visible the, the the benefits of sandboxing. Uh, for instance, one thing which we have been talking at the GPI uh, group is on focusing on uh, procurement and particularly on public procurement, which is an area which we notice many many countries, especially uh, uh, the regional uh, regional public organisations or smaller uh, public uh, uh, governments do struggle with the uh, issue of procuring AI-like uh, uh, products and services and a sandbox which would support them uh, understanding the, the, the legal but also the uh, innov innov innovatory implications of sandboxing or of uh, procu uh, uh, using AI in procurement or uh, other type of uh, specific activity like that, it would be probably beneficial because it also would show for those that are going to develop the sandbox also a kind of a direct benefit. So it would be a kind of a win-win situation. So I would kind of suggest that focusing uh, sandboxing on specific areas of activity might be a more useful way to go forward than demanding obligation of sandboxes in general. Certainly, if there's more demand than supply, if there were common criteria to prioritize 
who gets into the sandbox because they're dealing with very interesting or salient or widespread issues. That's that's not a bad idea. Uh, Detlev, thank you for being so patient. So as I said right at the beginning, you've been around digital innovation for, for a very long time. And you and I have been talking about sandboxes and can they apply everywhere? Can you do general purpose AI sandboxing or does it have to be application specific? I'd, I'd be very grateful for your comments in the light of your own experience on the debate we've had so far. And what is it we're missing in terms of making this um, take off quickly and be a success for Europe? Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> I would like to uh, phrase um, my answer um, to your question around the incentive and disincentives to participate in uh, in sandboxes. Um, so one, um, I think it was um, uh, Chandri, Chandrima who, who was saying partnership is a, is one of the incentives to participate, and uh, this is true. But uh, the problem here is that they are not uh, a su sufficient number of, uh, of AI sandboxes uh, that can be handled by the regulators. Um, so there's a kind of capacity problem. And uh, as, uh, as An Angeliki was saying, there is a, um, a kind of already an incentive to start with sandboxes with partners. So obviously Meta has uh, assembled partners and uh, Dragos was also saying about the kind of <clears throat> civil uh, society initiative um, to estimate and audit uh, a bias. So the, those partnerships de develop without an AI sandbox. So obviously an AI sandbox is not the, the, uh, uh, the answer to everything, but it could be a contribution. Uh, another, um, and I think the most important uh, incentive is probably to understand the complexity of the AI regulation. And uh, so this would be um, probably very helpful for participants um, to plow through all those kind of uh, um, uh, uh, obligations and uh, the side ref references which you have in this uh, in this AI act and uh, for uh, bigger companies therefore the AI sandbox is um, probably a way to show we are eth an ethical um, uh, responsible company so I quite honestly see um, the benefits more for the smaller medium-sized companies than for the bigger companies. The bigger companies can do this kind of project by themselves. They don't need help to go through the complexity of this. They, they will use AI sandboxes as a showcase for we are ethical. And this is the zeitgeist of these days. Um, it's no longer about competitiveness, it's about ethical. And uh, so, uh, therefore, for the small and medium-sized companies, it's much more important. And luckily, the, the regulation has this kind of chapter, which oblige, uh, obliges the, um, the member states to do something um, in favor of SMEs. But the reality is very often, uh, normally, uh, those kind of programs that are supposed to support SMEs are very heavy in themselves. And SMEs, they want quick results and they want to go forward, and they will not uh, necessarily uh, rely on uh, government support. So this is another downside of this. Um, the, the advantage, of course, is also that you don't uh, have to fear any fines uh, if, you, if you act in good faith, as the regulation says, um, but you still are liable. So there's, a no, there's, there's no exemption from liability. So this is, uh, if you want, um, uh, this is the, 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 the positive incentive side. But there are also disincentives to participate. Um, uh, uh, one of them is additional costs. So instead of doing this um, uh, according to, to your market needs, etc., you would have to follow a number of steps. And so the, the <clears throat> to help to the complexity of the regulation, you add the complexity of the AI um, uh, sandboxes. And this is what is in the uh, regulation is already quite a long list. And then of course you will have the, imp uh, the implementing act and the implementing act will stipulate all kinds of things, what you need to do in order to submit your, your proposal and so on and so forth in order to have a harmonized, which is good, a harmonized approach across, uh, across Europe. Here, this, the, the logic is clear, but the danger, and therefore my plea, uh, unfortunately, Dragos is, is gone, would be would be careful that you don't overregulate AI sandboxes because they are just about 
to make the complexity of the regulation less complex. So if you add an AI sandbox with a lot of regulation, you, you, just, uh, you, you just kill your own initiative, if you like. Another uh, uh, dis disincentive um, is um, business secrets. So the question is, of course, what kind of sandbox is it? So if it, is it like uh, we want to test a bit how we get, get, can get uh, biases in our data sets under control, Yes, of course, you, you can, uh, you can uh, share the data, you can give open access, you can involve civil, uh, civil societies. But if you really want to have a competitive product on the market, uh, you don't want to share your algorithm. You don't want to share a lot of other things. So the incentives will be, or the, the, the AI sandbox will be rather biased towards this kind of, yes, we want to test certain kind of um, uh, uh, exercises well, um, because uh, and civil society can can be helpful. I also want to warn, and you see, uh, uh, Robert, I'm a little bit on the on the side to put some some water into the wine huh? after all this kind of uh, positive and welcoming uh, uh, kind of comments. Uh, one of the problems with civil societies I have in my own experience is they are functionaries. Uh, they do not represent necessarily the society or etc. They have their own interests. And therefore, I would want to, to equalize the interests of individuals with the interest of civil society organizations. You should treat civil society organizations as they are lobbyists. Yeah. So this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, bringing them into a kind of uh, uh, holy state, uh, I would warn against. They should be involved, yes, but treat them as they uh, as they are. And uh, so, this rounds up a little bit uh, uh, my comments on this. And with a final comment, I think uh, there is an interesting um, uh, um, uh, other initiative in the AI Act, and this is the testing in real world conditions. And so, the companies have the choice to go through the AI sandboxes or through the testing in the real world conditions. And I think the, the testing in the real world conditions are much more interesting for companies than the AI sandbox. So, I think there will be probably a kind of uh, dichotomy between the AI sandboxes and the testing. On the one hand, you will in the AI sandbox test this kind of societal biases, the, the discrimination facts, where you work with civil societies and so on and so forth, on the one hand. And uh, the testing will be rather for products which are placed on the market, because here you don't need to open up your algorithms or anything else. You just have to um, be under the control of the market surveillance authority in order to test uh, the deployment. Um, of, of, of your solution, of your product. So I think this kind of interplay between the two will be very interesting to, to solve. So first of all, it's a very positive thing to have AI sandboxes and this real testing market, but please don't overregulate this. Your, your Sorry, I was, I was listening so attentively that I've forgotten to unmute myself. Thanks very much, Detlef. So. I, the devil is in the detail, and I think you mentioned some some disincentives, including costs and complexity, but also transparency. So I'd like to go straight back to Chandrima and to Angeliki and to ask what 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 you already do some participatory uh, design or some uh, policy prototyping. How do you reconcile? participation with confidentiality. So I'd really just like a, a comment from our corporate innovators on that, and then I'll come to your Danka. And I also want to encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, to put in your questions now, because in half an hour, you'll wish you'd done it earlier, because by then we'll be wrapping up. Uh, so Chandrima first, then Anjali. Uh, thanks, Robert, and thanks, Detlef. Those are very interesting uh, comments. I completely appreciate what you're saying about not all civil society groups being painted with the same brush, and I totally agree with that. So I think we would have to be quite clear about what governances these groups would represent. And of course, we would want to include groups that 
do have a mandate um, either through cooperative structures or collaborative structures to represent their individual constituents. Absolutely, I am so in agreement with that. In response to your question, uh, Robert, um, regarding like um, the innovativeness of the algorithm and their competitiveness in the market and uh, reporting standardized, standardized fairness uh, constraints. So um, from a technical perspective, there are ways in reporting fairness and unbiasedness metrics and constraint um, adherence and conformity which do not actually express the details of the algorithm itself. And at Fujitsu Research, we would be hoping to report these metrics, not just for the sake of competitiveness and protecting innovations, but also for the sake of transparency. So we would really like um, uh, to demonstrate to as many people and as democratically as possible, um, how our algorithms are safe and responsible. And for that, it's important to not get lost in the technical details of the actual implementation. So I think that would be my main comment around that. Thank you. Uh, that's that I mean, my my non technical comment is that sounds almost too good to be true. But what you what you seem to be saying is there are bits of our world beating innovation that we actually actively want to test with people. So you you believe that you can keep keep confidentiality, confidentiality. that's a sort of blockbuster business innovation, but show some of the. Um, elements of the offering which may be creating or may be feared as creating bias etc is that right I mean, so you're basically able not... to take some modules and open the black box and keep the black box closed in some other so we can we can absolutely so we can uh, report some explainability measures and we can report some group fairness measures maybe in some cases depending upon the specific sectorial business case we can report some individual fairness measures as well, but these would not go into literally the lines of the algorithm that would create or implement the code. Yeah. Um, and my hope is in the future, we would be able to report some data set standardization um, metrics as well, but okay. we don't do that just yet. Good. Uh, Angeliki, do you have a comment on this same set of issues? Uh, yes, actually, I, I just want to um, to go back of what Detlef mentioned. Uh, first of all, I, I fully agree that overregulation hinders innovation, so we should not start regulating before we have uh, test something uh, in practice and see what are the potential limitations, but also um, opportunities that we'll create. Uh, and what I would like also to um, briefly um, discuss with you are the preliminary results we had from um, a particular a small and medium enterprises where we test this policy prototyping and we ask them about their incentive and why they want actually to participate in, in sandboxes. Um, so the main question we raised was that um, what was the, their opinion on the concept of AI regulatory sandboxes as uh, described in Article 53 of uh, the European AI Act and also for which reasons they will participate in a sandbox. So almost all uh, of the participants, uh, which are mainly, as I mentioned before, AI SMEs, uh, but also startups operating in Europe, uh, remarked that a sandbox environment could contribute to a more responsible AI innovation and expressed at the same time their willingness to participate in a regulatory sandbox. Um, another reason was the, um, the ability to test the race AI systems in a real uh, life uh, setting. It's something that also Detlef uh, mentioned before, or at least a close to a real um, life setting. And in this way, they believe that um, they can foster innovation. And, um, and I have to say that this was also the most important reason to participate in a sandboxing exercise, according to them. Another reason was um, that um, uh, was actually the possibility to collaborate with regulators. Um, they believe that it's super important to be and, and they define it like as an opportunity, this exercise to be closer with the regulators, uh, ensuring a proactive compliance and, and contributing to the efficient um, uh, operationalization, I would say, of uh, technical requirements. And um, and we also saw that um, and a reflection we did as a company afterwards uh, is that um, there are certain conditions that must be met for a sandbox to be effective. 
Uh, and something that also uh, Yordanka mentioned before is legal certainty and a, co um, a collaborative environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe that currently in, um, in Article 53 of the proposed regulation are not really uh, covered in depth. So um, we observe that these elements could be addressed uh, through implementing acts and, and guidance at the sandbox level. But something is something perhaps um, Yordanka can also um, enlighten us a bit more uh, when it comes to, to Article 53. Um, that's all for, for the moment. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And I know, Angeliki, that you may have to slip away, so feel free when you have to. Uh, you're like, if I come to you, so Dragos has skipped off as Detlef uh, noticed he had other business, but but often people blame, I always say, us in the commission for doing the over-regulation thing. So can I ask you not just to comment because you put up your hand, but also to respond to Detlef's comment that we have to avoid over-regulating sandboxes, which are in themselves um, an experiment. So how do, how, how do you respond to that? How do we avoid over-specifying what we need to do? No, indeed, that's a very, a very relevant comment. And from our side, uh, we do understand that we want to have certain common understanding and harmonized approach, how this is implemented in different member states. On the other hand, certainly, we would not like to prescribe or create exactly or increase the complexity that is already enough uh, with the AI Act. So we, we are fully uh, there uh, and agree on this point. And as was mentioned by Eckhart, indeed, the key objective is to make those sandboxes actually more accessible to SMEs. And it is clear that if the process is too, too overcomplicated, um, it would actually disincentivize them to, to apply. So from our perspective, we really want to learn from uh, all the examples that we have already seen there, have like a simplified process um, for, for this future implementation. And that's maybe linked to one of the questions that were asked in the chat. Indeed, it is true that um, some member states are much more advanced, others are less. On the other hand, this common approach could also help um, um, in a way countries that are not so advanced uh, to have uh, the to, to just to follow the algorithm and even have the, some templates and clear uh, and easy procedures that they could follow to to run uh, the sandbox. Um, so um, that's a key objective. And in the future, once we, we really look for this implementing acts, so the, their objective so will be to ensure this uh, easy, simple, um, and also flexible rules that could be followed uh, for the author by the authorities. Um, now, another aspect um, that was um, also uh, raised um, um, was um, also for the incentives for the companies. Um, and it is true, we also support very much this real world testing. Um, now, the changes that were done uh, by the council um, uh, and, and the relationship, how the real world testing could interact with the sandbox is indeed an interesting question. Um, you could do a real world testing already in the sandbox and you could have a lot of legal certainty also, but you could even have some derogations the way the council has proposed it from also the procedures you have to follow if you are outside the real world testing. So some also say, okay, you still have a lot of things there. Um, you might even also still not be very certain or you want to have also this certainty that was raised by, uh, that was mentioned by Shadrima and this cooperation with regulators. So you better understand and you're sure that indeed your product is not only tested <laughs> on the market, but it is also in the end uh, going to be a compliant and you have the understanding that this will be the case uh, also with the relevant regulator on board. So, so we see these opportunities uh, also there, certainly to have the real world testing in the sandbox. Now, whether you can have completely diverging approaches, how different member states do that in practice, or there should be some common understanding, even if they are not exactly the same procedures as if you do it outside the sandbox, is, is something we, we still want to reflect. Um, and then finally on the question uh, also a bit, because it's a really important one, how to bring all countries on board. Uh, and, and actually to make those sandboxes a bit more accessible in different countries. 
we, we do uh, recognize that uh, this is a challenge. Uh, and on one hand, indeed, having a, some common framework and support also from peer projects from other countries is one way to bring also other regulators uh, so, so they can learn from others and they could rely on the common framework. We also support very much to have cross-border sandboxes in the future. We plan to have this as one of the possibilities that we would actually encourage because different countries could, could partner, some of that are more advanced or leading. Um, this is what we are also trying to do now with the Spanish pilot. Um, already before the regulation is adopted so other countries could also join learn from this experience and and also have um have them also for the future as part of a bigger cross-border sandbox and something that indeed is very important is the funding um yeah, there are different tools existing and mechanisms on already at the EU level. For example, Spain has used their uh, recovery and resilience fund. We know there are also other instruments for regulatory reforms that could be used by the member states. Um, it's a question whether in the future the Digital Euro program um, should um, also not building on what we are already doing in, for the testing and experimentation facilities, maybe also uh, have some funding for this. This is for the member states uh, to decide or even to consider for countries who don't have their own sandboxes, maybe to have uh, also something more supported at European level as a facilitator, the way we, for example, have in the blockchain pan-European sandboxes where regulators from different countries are just connected without having their own uh, sandboxes. Um, on the ground. So um, we are uh, very keen to look further into to these different options and also to support and bring uh, um, everyone uh, on board um, to create them. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, you can see from the chat that people share Detlef's comment that we need to maintain interoperability between sandboxes without over-regulating and to respect, I suppose, the specificities at local level as well as having a clear set of general rules. I, I think that my, my own comment would, would be that obviously this is an area where the co-legislators have a lot of work to do, but also you've already launched a pilot from the Commission side, and I think we'll learn a lot from that. I think that the, the willingness, I, Chandrima mentioned distributed ownership, the willingness of everybody as Dragos says, to have regulators in the loop, yes, but not necessarily the sole host. That may be something worth experimenting with. And in the short term, it seems to me that in order to have coverage from day one, you may need to say every member state must designate its default sandbox as opposed to every member state must build one, because otherwise you will have um, some member states which are smaller in the AI space, building one because it says you have to have one, but it will be rather small. And then you have a sort of regulatory risk that if it's small, it may not be efficient. So I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting uh, reflection here for the for the startup phase. Uh, and the other thing which is important, I think, for AI as for sandboxes is we're going to be learning even after we've gone live, and therefore. To, to say you know, we're going to review it very frequently is going to be a success factor. But these are these are clearly um, major issues. One comment, I mean, I, I see that um, Anik Bayok is is in the in the meeting, but one comment I would make is I don't understand civil society involvement as only meaning organizations. You can also imagine participatory design as being focus groups. So if I'm about to do an AI instance for insurance, maybe the sandbox would do a focus group of people who might be buying insurance from my ultimate customers. And then you get real people responding. And in a lot of consumer protection issues, looking at real people in a focus group or a, a laboratory type setting of a sandbox can be very illuminating for designers as for regulators. So those are a few comments from me. Um, you've answered, I think, the panel, the questions from Katerina Jordanova. 
and the comment about avoiding overregulation. There's another question I just throw out there where I think the answer is obviously yes, but I think comments would be welcome. Christina uh, Velianova saying, do you see any need to include ethics experts in the whole process? I'm sure the answer is yes. And I know that both companies and regulators have ethics expertise at the heart of their processes. But any comments on that? Maybe, maybe Angeliki Chandrima as to, you know, do you have ethicists? Do you have anthropologists? Who, who helps you? It's not just technicians trying to be ethical, right? So indeed, actually, as we mentioned uh, before, uh, given the difficulty also in assessing the, um, uh, the most appropriate and feasible balance amongst governance instruments, um, and, and especially in the technology like AI, um, we, of course, uh, base our work on ethical frameworks. Uh, we have uh, specific uh, principles. We have uh, codes of conduct that we follow. Uh, and uh, indeed, actually, um, we explore different uh, combinations um, and, and among those instruments and, and always um, in, li in line with our, uh, let's say, code of conduct and ethical uh, principles we have in, in the company to, uh, to work in this important exercise. So the, question, the answer indeed to this question is yes. Uh, Chandrima? Um, so I am an ethics expert myself, so obviously I'm going to say definitely sign me on, but uh, more seriously, so the way I see my job um, is as a scientist, so um, a, lot of the, a lot of the things that we have talked about, as in what is going to work for people, how do we know that, these are values questions, and I see my job as translating these values questions, which can be, which are quite normative, into um, algorithms into um, sort of more normative, a combination of normative and utilitarian frameworks. So everything mathematical is utilitarian. You optimize over some goal. And it is our belief at Fujitsu is that this goal cannot be something that is universal for everyone, which is why we emphasize on the need for participatory design frameworks. And um, as an ethicist, my, my role is to figure out how to create those individual values into algorithms. So in the design process, particularly when we're designing unbiased fitness metrics and figuring out how to report these metrics and how to standardize it, I would see roles of people like me to be quite important. Excellent. Uh, Detlef, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um... That was, uh, uh, Sandrima was saying, um, uh, goes in, uh, in the direction that I was uh, answering it. Uh, let's make an example, um, because it's very overlooked that you have in this um, very difficult question of biases and ethics, you have sometimes, uh, not sometimes, most of the time, um, and uh, what, interesting to see whether Sandrima agrees, um, you have a trade-off. Um, uh, so there is nothing like justice in the world that is unifiable uh, identity uh, that you can determine. So uh, equally for bias, it's a statistical in, in AI is mostly, not entirely, but mostly a statistical problem, mostly in the data set. And of course, then the algorithm that, let's say, generates um, the results. And uh, the, the bias is very often between um, which part of um, the correctness you want to go for. What is the exact balance? A very good example is this compass um, for the experts. It's, it's a compass um, a system in the US um, in, the, in the criminal uh, justice uh, department. And so uh, it really depends on how you decide this. And you need uh, experts uh, like Chan Rima who translate uh, this kind of ethical questions fully aware of the trade-offs into algorithms and makes also the policymakers aware that they have to make a decision. Do I want this or do I want something else? And uh, there's nothing where you can say, this is the only way you can decide. This is very much overlooked by regulators. They believe there is um, the possibility to exclude all biases. And no, you only have to decide which bias is more socially acceptable than others. Just if I may, just to uh, quickly uh, react to what Detlef uh, said, just also we, we know also the bias does not come exclusively from data. I mean, what we need, I mean, what the Commission needs to consider, consider is also are also sources of bias across the AI uh, system lifecycle in, instead of uh, focusing entirely on data. 
So, um, which is just a reflection and it's something that we should also take into account while uh, we work on, on such exercises. Yeah, I, I, I think this is a very important discussion and it leads to the point which was made during the initial presentations, which is that sandbox boxes help regulators also to learn. And I would add in the light of what you've just said, not only regulators of AI, I, for example, in the anti-money laundering world, we're making life so difficult, this is a non-regulator speaking, so difficult for banks that they simplify their life by saying there are certain things I won't do. Not because I can't do them, but because it's marginal to my business. And at the retail end, um, there's a bank I work with in France that says, no, if you're not a resident in France, we don't want to open a current account anymore. Uh, and that's not a requirement of the law, but it's a result of the law. And I think though that's, and I would say that's a bias. In a way that means that there's a detriment to consumers who would like to have a local account, even if they're not resident in some place in the Eurozone. So there's a consumer policy issue. And it's the result of the weight of regulation compared to the weight of business. Somehow AI regulation has to leave space for business to make some such judgments. And if we don't want that to happen, then you have to either deregulate or create a positive obligation. These are considerations which are beyond the AI sandbox, but which, and maybe it's a point for your danker, the feedback from an AI sandbox shouldn't only go to people implementing AI regulation. It also has to go to the people regulating the vertical. And I think this, this brings us, and so I'll go back to the commission, to a question which we have noticed in, in our introductory paper, which was how do existing sandboxes like finance, data protection in some member states, how do they get integrated or networked with an AI sandbox? Because the, there are different ways to work out what policy we want, and the sandbox is one of them, and it's very relevant to the AI Act. But how do we plug it into all the other bits of regulation that may need to change or to take account of the existence of AI or what we're learning from the sandbox? Is that something, Yodanka, you have a, a it's, it's already wired in or it's wiring that needs to be built? No, thank you. That's a very good question indeed. That is something we have reflected because already when we propose the act, it's a very complex legislation, but it, it interacts in a already in a regulated environment. You have data protection, consumer protection, sandboxes on fintech, as you said, and, and we apply across all sectors. So uh, it has been indeed a key element that we have thought about. So if you look at our proposal, we already said that the sandboxes should be used as a tool to monitor and also give guidance and uh, ensure this adaptation, agile adaptation of legislation, not only for the AI Act, but also where appropriate for other relevant legislation that would, could apply to the AI system. And there is also this aspect of governance there that we have also tried to encourage cooperation between the market surveillance authority responsible for the AI Act and the AI sandboxes and the involvement of other sectoral regulators um, because we indeed uh, think that it's a complex matter. It's not only one AI system that will have to be compliant with the AI Act. Often you might have also interaction with, with other legislation and it would be good to have also the data protection. That's particularly important because we also propose to have a legal basis and most of the systems actually raise a lot of questions uh, for compliance with the GDPR, also interaction with the requirements. So we think that that's very important, but also other authorities like, for example, equality bodies who are actually the one competent to really draw the borderline between uh, unlawful discrimination that should be really forbidden and not allowed and any other bias that, as was said, could be actually inevitable and you just have to make the right choice. So um, here, indeed, we think all these um, relevant regulators, uh, representatives would be good to have on board, including from the financial sector, we think even 
it could be easier because in our case we have proposed the same financial supervisory authority that runs the fintech sandbox mm -hmm. could be also the one competent for the ai sandbox so they could very easily integrate the ai sandbox requirements into already what they are doing uh, or if not uh, we could have also more general ai sandbox and then just ensure cooperation uh, case by case basis, depending on the projects, because we also have to give this flexibility. Uh, as was mentioned, we also don't want to over prescribe everything. We want to give the hooks for authorities to cooperate, um, but we want to also give a lot of flexibility so they find the right way at national level to do it, depending on their system. And just also to confirm that indeed we think this flexibility is important. We should have some common procedures or ways how we reflect in general but flexibility and indeed most of the decisions should stay with the authorities on the ground how, how they can uh, best uh, implement it um, in practice and then maybe for the final question on the ethicists indeed we think besides regulators and also lawyers i think because many of these issues are uh, very linked to, to applicable legislation data protection or, or others Indeed, the ethicists uh, are, are very important because they are issues that are not only for, um, for legal compliance with fundamental rights, but go a bit beyond also this uh, societal aspect uh, there. So uh, also cooperation with researchers and, and others. Yes, regulators have to be involved, but we think they should also very well uh, cooperate, embrace to the extent possible um, that there is at national level with other facilities, innovation labs and others that could actually make the sandbox a bit more inclusive um, and, and also its impact a bit um, broader. Thank you. And before I pass on to other panelists, I have a, a final question in the chat from David Bierbauer. And I think it, it, it falls to the commission to comment on it, whether you know your answer or not, which is whether you think that we need to create new legal grounds for data processing in the AI Act to allow the training of AI systems. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, no, actually, it was a response from the... Uh, can I reply to that question? Uh, yes, that's my I, suggestion. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Sorry, because I think someone else was speaking. Um, so uh, in, we have already proposed in the AI proposal to, to have a specific legal ground for further processing of personal data in the sandbox. So um, it is already there. And we think that actually this could be also one of the other incentives why companies might want to go because now there are a lot of uncertainties um, whether they could actually use existing data that are lawfully collected for, for these purposes. Uh, and um, now with this legal ground, um, we would they would have legal certainty and they would also have more opportunities to further process it uh, with, subject to those uh, safeguards. Um, but this applies only to the sandbox as it is proposed now, and we'll see also how it evolves because we have seen that there might be certain um, in the council. It's kept actually, they even enlarge the types of systems for which this could be used, including many others like on mobility, security, critical infrastructure. But uh, we, we'll see how it goes with the parliament because I think. Uh, um, they are a bit more careful with uh, too much extending it as a legal base, or, and there were even some groups who didn't like it. So, so we'll see the final outcome from the trilogue. Very good. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've closed the questions list, and the panel has bravely answered all the questions. Before I close, what I'd like to do is to run through our uh, four remaining attendees uh, in the same order that they spoke, simply to ensure that everybody has put all their wisdom on the table. I don't have an additional question myself. Uh, so if I go Chandrima, Angeliki, Yodanka, Detlev, uh, final thoughts, and then I'll sum up. Chandrima. 
Um, so in terms of final thoughts, um, I think that the biggest thing that I have taken away from this session is that the governance structures are more complicated, but um, it is my firm belief that these governances will be addressed through um, a joint partnership. And I do think that uh, this partnership should exist between the public and the private sectors because there are very good things that can be brought from both sides of the table, whether it be regulatory ex expertise, expertise of governances, but also the technological know-how, um, ethical technology know-how, um, all of these things to be brought together in creating the sandbox. And as I have been saying throughout this conversation, I think it's extremely important to make sure that the entire sandbox generation process, and in fact, the AI technology generation process remains value aligned with the interests of individual users and civil society groups, whether it be through lobbying groups or whether it be through more democratic means such as focus groups or having uh, groups represented who have a more collaborative or cooperative structure. All of these are equally valid. And um, I can just reiterate the commitment from Fujitsu Research that we are trying to uh, implement and deploy technologies that have a focus on being responsible first and foremost and being value aligned. So thank you so much for having this conversation. Thanks, Chandu. Angeliki? Um, so yeah, I would like to end with um, a few uh, recommendations to policymakers. So I think it's important uh, that policymakers uh, focus on procedure instead of prescription. Uh, it's something that also your Danka mentioned before as a way to determine high-risk AI applications. Um, it's also important to be uh, as specific as possible in the definition of risks uh, within regulatory scope. Um, there is a need of improvement of the um, existing documentation uh, regarding risk assessment, also, but, uh, but also decision-making processes uh, by justifying the selection of mitigation measures. Um, also, the, um, the taxonomy of, of the different AI actors um, is involved in the um, in, in risk assessment is is very important to be developed. Um, they also need to specify as much as possible uh, the set of uh, values that may be impact, impacted by AI and, and provide at the same time uh, guidance on how they may be in tension with uh, one another. And um, as also uh, that I've mentioned before, I mean, we sh this should not reinvent the wheel. I mean, what is important is to combine a new uh, risk assessment processes with established ones uh, in order to improve the, um, the overall approach of uh, sandboxes. Thank you very much as well for the interesting discussion and I look forward to the next ones. Thank you. Your thank you. Thank you also from my side for this very interesting discussion. I think uh, it, it was really important to hear uh, so many good examples and recommendations uh, that um, I noted well, we take on board and I think we we align with uh, much of what was said uh, and our objective will be indeed for the future just to, to build and to make this workable in practice because we, we know that indeed that's the hardest uh, line now to come um, and yes we are going to to be very open to continue this dialogue and also involve uh, um, Shantrima, uh, Desler, Angeliki and, and, and in general uh, for, for our future thinking once we also know the where the parliament and the council would like to go with uh, with the sandboxes so we work together to implement them. Thank you very much. Desler? Yeah, I would like to close with a specific issue, um, namely the coordination or the cooperation between the national um, um, uh, authorities and the mutual learning. I mean, there, there, there will be exit reports from the um, uh, AI sandboxes. They will be submitted to the commission and they will be submitted to the AI board and there will be probably some institutionalized cooperation. Um, the experience I have made um, is that those kind of exercises are okay, they are, they are useful, better than nothing, but they do not lead to learning. Um, now they say, how, how, how is that because we are meeting and so on and so forth. The way those meetings work is that the commission presents, the member states are listening and then they go home and nothing happens. And um, this is the reality in, in, in most of the exercises that you have, where the Commission assembles member states for mutual learning. Now, uh, my advice also now to Jordanka is have a look at this and try to, let's say, break this kind of static bureaucratic system into a real learning. 
And the best example I have made in my career is with the public employment services. So well, go to DG Employment, please, and uh, learn from the public employment services mutual learning exercise. Because this was the one where uh, one really gets together and goes into the details of learning. This kind of via meeting, we are uh, assembling reports and the commission presents will not lead to learning. So this is it's just my, uh, if you like, my uh, uh, two cents uh, uh, advice to the commission. Yeah, but as, as often Detlef, it's evidence-based and practical. Uh, let me, ladies and gentlemen, just offer a few thoughts uh, from, from my position. Firstly, and it wasn't evident, but it's very heartwarming, everybody wants to play with sandboxes. So there's a very positive overall uh, response to the Commission's initial proposal. And what I most um, like in the conversation is we put slightly different labels on it, Open Innovation 2.0, participatory design, policy prototyping, but we all understand this as an opportunity for opening up so that it's not just a, a dialogue of the death between a, an innovator and a regulator, it's a much richer conversation. And I, I personally think that is in itself a big achievement. So we have a policy basis which is positive. I think the, um, the devil is in the detail. I think all of you were revealing in the discussion, not only Detlef at the end, that the details need further attention. So in that sense, thanks to the AI for People organizers, this has been a timely discussion. How do we ensure full access? How do we uh, ensure a learning process, as Detlef said at the end, how do we avoid overregulation? And my comment as well would be, how do we ensure that everybody has access at the beginning, even if not all national instances have been established? Um, who does it? I think there, um, there is a message for further reflection by the co-legislators and by the commission, because a simple, it, it's the obvious approach is the regulator hosts it. But actually, that may not create an open enough uh, dynamic, and it may not create enough supply. I liked the idea from Chandrima that this should be distributed ownership. I certainly agree with what Dragos said, that obviously the regulator is there, because without a regulator, the sandbox is just a, a, a sort of private playground. But I think that's an interesting thing to think about. And, and finally, I think pass all of the burden back to your Danker and to our colleagues in the Commission, as well as in the other institutions. How do we optimize, especially at the beginning? Um, I personally, in, in how do we make learning work, I personally think that the peer-to-peer the -peer approach often works as a component because national level regulators understand and respect each other's different starting points. And peer-to-peer -peer learning, whether it's been in food safety or cyber security in my own experience, it allows member states to learn from each other without feeling that the EU institutions are pointing a finger at them and saying you have failed. So I think that is important. I think there's space to have not just civil society organizations, but real people as we were discussing. Um, and maybe also to, to think about doing what certain specialized courts do in, in many member states, which is to have not just regulators and regulated and citizens, but also assessors, people with a certain amount of expertise who can help the regulator, who can mediate the conversations in a sandbox. And I think that goes to the point that somebody made from Flor Hestina about you know, ethicists, yes, and we have Chandrima on the panel, but I think we need that sort of expertise which bridges between the regulatory vision, what society wants, and the business innovation. Um, but finally, I think the, the only way to go smoothly in a launch will be to throw some money at it to make sure that EU resources are devoted to helping all sandboxes to flourish quickly. And then to recognize that learning is an iterative process, it's going to take time. So I conclude this conversation, which has been very rich, uh, very happy, 
as a moderator. So thanks to all our panelists for being extremely um, open and responsive, but also encouraged on the substance. So I hope that the Commission and, and in due course, the Council and Parliament will feel encouraged that the, the principle is very widely welcomed and we just have to get it right. So thanks to all for attending. Thanks especially to our panelists and there can't be a burst of applause over the ether, but that's what's happening um, at home. Uh, and you don't need to travel safely home, but enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you very much from me, and uh, thanks to AI for People. Goodbye. <laughs>